back to page 19. Jesus in Jerusalem, Last Supper, Gethsemane, Trial and Crucifixion. I said to you yesterday that whatever we say about Jesus, whatever story we tell about the crucifixion is, is, a, is a densely theological story because it's a story of how God in Christ is saving the world. That is our faith. And therefore the story that we tell has got to be an adequate one. So the story that we tell about Jesus and um, the last days in, in Jerusalem has got to bear the weight of the stories of the Palestinian suffering that we've heard. It's got to bear the weight of the story that Yad Vashem has just been telling us. Uh, and that's, that's an extraordinary weight. Um, just to give you some sense of that, there, was, uh, there has been a great deal of Holocaust theology done. What, what, what does the Holocaust say to us theologically about God? There are lots of things. One of the things it says is that actually the Holocaust was something that was inflicted by the church, by Christians. So the Holocaust is inflicted on Jews by what was arguably one of the most Christian nations on the planet, at least in terms of its theological education. You know, the greatest Bible teachers and the greatest theologians of the 20th century were German. And these were the people who inflicted on, uh, on it. The people, the ordinary German people who made sure that the Zyklon B was produced in the factories and got to the, got to the gas chambers in Auschwitz and other places on time were German Christians. And we talk about Karl Barth and Dietrich Bonhoeffer as though they represented us, the church. They were the, the exceptions. The confessing church in Germany was tiny. That's one of the things it tells us. Uh, one of the things it also tells us is, um, as we saw that story, did you see how many, how many parallels there were between what was done to the Jews, how, it was, how the Holocaust was administered, and, and what we've heard uh, going on in, in, in Palestine and Israel. And doesn't that say something about human evil? Human evil shapes and scars its victims. So instead of it necessarily conscientizing its victims so that we, we vow it must never happen again, we do what Israel is doing. Israel is built on the memory of the Holocaust. It must never happen again. And it has become, it must never happen again to us. And once you once you do the, it to us, then it is okay to do whatever is necessary. It's called security uh, to, 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 to whomever you perceive as a threat. But what about, what about what it does to us? But you see, before, before we get excited, we, we, we need to... Did you see the bit of the exhibition which was about the failure of the church to say anything yeah. yeah the the why wasn't Auschwitz not bombed that that bit of the exhibition the the failure of the of the, of the Catholic Church we're all implicated in this stuff this is stuff that we all do and we can all do it the, any if it can happen in Nazi Germany if it can happen here in Israel to the victims of the Holocaust it can happen anywhere we, we've got to take that that on the chin and one of the Holocaust theologians says, you've got to allow that to bear theological weight, which means you've got to allow it to tell us something about God. And one of the things that, that a Holocaust theologian said is, after Auschwitz, you cannot say anything about God that cannot be said in the presence of burning babies. In other words, you cannot proclaim some kind of salvation message about Jesus that does not touch the worst and deepest and most 
agonizing, godless, God-forsaken situations in which human beings find themselves. Otherwise, Jesus is not the savior of the world. That's theologically the kind of crunch of the stuff that we are hearing. It means, though, that, that in terms of when we talk about salvation, whose questions does salvation need to address? And it's, it's the victim's questions about salvation. Our stories of the cross, our stories of Easter, our stories of Jesus and our stories of the church have been shaped by a church that's post 313. In other words, it's a church that changed sides in the power game. And so it was no longer a church who was praying, when on earth are we getting rid of empire? When on earth will we get rid of the Antichrist, the emperor? When on earth will we get rid of the false kingdom of God, the pretension to the kingdom of God, which is the Roman Empire? Instead, it becomes the church of empire. And suddenly, if the kingdom of God has come, which is the Christianized world, hey, the emperor's a Christian, hallelujah, we must be living in the kingdom. So the emperor overnight moves from being the Antichrist to the Messiah. <laughs> And, 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 and the, the empire becomes the kingdom. Well, then what do we do? Well, well, then the question, the salvation question is, okay, if all that is sorted out, if the world is sorted out, what about us when we die? When we go to heaven? And how can we be sure that our sins will be forgiven and we'll go to heaven when we die? And that becomes the narrative of salvation that we talk about. Yet for the people who are suffering, the salvation questions become, where is God? Why does God allow this to me? When will we be saved? How can I continue to believe and hope? Is there anything that tells me that Easter Sunday is real when actually life is a living hell? And when we read the story of Jesus that Mark tells us, and I, I've, I've used Mark's story, it's, it's the oldest one. One thing I, 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 want, I want to say, which I've said before, we dare not do jigsaw theology when it comes to, 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 to the cross. Jigsaw theology is that bit about taking bits from Matthew, bits from Mark, bits from Luke and John, and putting them all together. So you get, Jesus does seven words on the cross. No, he didn't. Each of the gospel writers tells us a very, very particular story. And, and each of them wants to emphasize that it's different. Folks, you can't marry up the crucifixion stories and we mustn't try to do it because each of the writers is absolutely conscious of what he's doing. He knows that he's not telling us the same, the same story. It is the same story. But it isn't told as in a sequence. The story doesn't unfold in the same way. So what does Mark tell us? Okay, let's, let's have a look at this. First of all, in, 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 um, in chapter 14 and verse 10, you get the betrayal narrative. Jesus is in Bethany where we just were. And then it is Judas, one of the twelve, who goes to the chief priests and scribes and says, pay me and I will betray him to you. Pay me and I will betray him to you. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve. Folks, we, we used to sort of at least thinking of Judas as a bit of a naughty guy. And, and if you've watched Jesus Christ Superstar or, or a whole shed load of films or read a whole load of books, you will see that the, the attempt has been to, to, to kind of um, rehabilitate Judas. You know, it was just that he made a terrible misjudgment in betraying Jesus. That is not what the narrative tells us. The narrative tells us that Judas was an absolute scuzz bucket who wanted money for himself and he knew that he could he could gain that kind of advantage by selling out Jesus and all his mates who were hiding out in Bethany and who'd gone to a heck of a lot of trouble to stay below the radar. And, and he's one of the twelve, one of Jesus' great mates. Remember, Jesus did not wander around with the Galilee with twelve people. 
He wandered around the Galilee with loads and loads of disciples and people following him, very particularly the women who make their appearance again at the cross. Um, but the twelve are his intimate circle. And, and that's, that's the horrific thing. So that, so that when Paul talks about the night that Jesus was be betrayed, uh, before he died, it was on the night in which he was betrayed. Isn't that interesting? It's not on the night in which, in which he did the Last Supper. It's not on the, on the night in which he, he instituted communion. It's not on the night in which, it's on the night in which he was betrayed. Because this is absolutely ghastly and unthinkable. And Judas is one of the twelve. And actually, the story goes, by the end of the narrative, by the end of Gethsemane, and then afterwards by the courtyard, everyone has betrayed Jesus. Not just Judas, everyone. The disciples have fled after Gethsemane, and Peter, bless him, you know, motor mouth, he's going, Lord, even if, if all the others desert you, I will never desert you, I will die for you. Peter's swearing and saying, I don't fucking know this guy. I mean, that's, that's what the Greek is trying to tell us. I'm not being, I'm not being gratuitously foul-mouthed. That is what he's trying to tell us. He swears, you know, with all the vehemence of Galilean fishermen. He didn't say, I'm sorry, you've made a mistake. I've never heard of this chap, right? And, and, and no wonder Peter is so broken. So it's a betrayal narrative. And we've got to see Jesus as knowing what was going on, not because of some woo-woo-woo foreknowledge from God, but because he knows exactly what he is doing and he has been tipped off by the Sanhedrin as to what's coming. And so he's made elaborate preparations to take the risky move of going into Jerusalem to set up the Last Supper. So he's got this kind of code. Guys, go into the city. You will see a man carrying a water jar. Now, men do not carry water jars. It's a crowded city, so look around and you'll see someone and you know it's it's the guy with the rolled up trouser leg the briefcase and the, and the red carnation that's your man okay follow him and he will go into a house give him a few moments then go knock on the door and say the master wants to prepare the place yeah and that's what happens and the disciples are all excited hey we've we've we, we're sitting down and now we've 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 evaded capture and Jesus said, you know what? One of you is going to betray me. And they're going, uh -huh. they're going, no, one of you sitting here is going to betray me. And that's, that is what happens. And, and if the question, you remember, remember we got the bit that we got to yesterday, which was where Jesus had prophesied the destruction of the temple. So if the temple is going to be destroyed, where, where does this presence, and the temple is supposed to be the presence of God on earth, where is the presence of God now to be located? That's Mark's theological question. Do you remember that when you read it at the trial, um, all the witnesses say, this man told us he would destroy the temple in three days, build it up with his own hands. The question about the temple. And the answer at the Last Supper is, the new temple is my body, says Jesus. This is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood which is shed for you. It becomes the place of God's mercy and forgiveness and rebuilding, the body of Christ. And how does Paul, who is the earliest Christian writer, how does he talk about the church? The body of Christ. We are to be, as the church, the continuing presence of Jesus Christ in the world. That we are the temple. That is what the temple was there for. That's theologically what, what, what we're being told here. And then they go to Gethsemane. And what have we got to do with Gethsemane? Gethsemane, says the German theologian Maltman, is an event between God and God. Between God the Son and the God whom Jesus calls Father. 
and it's the breakdown of the relationship between Jesus and God the Father that we see played out in Gethsemane where Jesus the Son says I have followed this I've done it you know it's my mission I've been faithful I haven't compromised I haven't given up but now dad this is me please and we see Jesus utterly alone his friends are over there and he is over here this spatial you know symbolic space between Jesus and his friends he is utterly alone before God now when Jesus is utterly alone before God that's a good place to be up until Gethsemane then it's a place where Jesus is terrified to be he says to his friends please stay here watch with me I don't want to do this on my own and he goes and he prays three times and three times when you pray the same thing three times or say the same thing three times in the Bible it's biblical speak for listen carefully I'll say this only once okay this is this is really important stuff please dad if it is possible I don't want to do this is there not another way and he is met with what silence silence the silence of God Luke tells us Luke tells us that at that point he gets angelic sustenance and help Mark tells us he's met with silence and Maltman the German theologian says you know what Jesus hear what Jesus says he prays Abba father daddy Abba father at the point at which God does not answer Jesus says okay I'll do it that's your will I will do it but he points out to the, the fact that after that Jesus no longer refers to his to God as as Abba he refers to God formally as Eloi Eloi and he says it, it's the smashed relationship and then Mark tells us Jesus is crucified and he hangs on the cross in mute agony for six hours and then he screams what my God my God why have you abandoned me and he dies and Maltman says this either the cry of abandonment by Jesus on the cross is the end of all theology you know there's nothing left to say God has abandoned Jesus the world is abandoned by God or he says it's the beginning of a specifically Christian theology which is about how God does not abandon the world because of Jesus I'll come back to that in a moment but let's look at the event there are two trials that Jesus now faces once he's been carted off two trials the first trial before the Sanhedrin the question or the charge to Jesus is are you the Messiah are you the liberator now in John's Gospel Jesus says I am and Caiaphas is the, the the high priest is outraged because says John he was thereby making himself equal with God yeah thereby making himself equal with God and we've made that a point of of Christian doctrine that, that what Caiaphas refused to do was to do what every decent Christian should because that's the theological tick box you have to tick if you're going to be a Christian and that is you've got to say Jesus is divine now that's true this is God, Jesus is God in human flesh among us all of the gospel writers are quite clear about that in different ways but you've got to hear that about as the, the real question is Jesus is in, in that theology Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God who is God in human flesh now if you're Roman there's only one God in human flesh and that's the Emperor so that's why he's going to get killed but Mark's theology Mark is saying he's the Messiah the liberator he is the one for whom all of Israel is hoping the question the question among the Jews is what about the Romans you know that was their biggest theological question as well as their existential question what about the Romans when is God going to save us the answer that the rabbis gave was when Israel keeps the law when Israel keeps the law 
So Jesus, who is a lawbreaker as far as the purity system is concerned, stands up and says, yes, I am the Messiah. It's the only time when Jesus says, yes, I am the Messiah. If you read the gospel, everywhere else, he's been telling the people, when somebody says, you're the Messiah, he says, yeah, but shut up about it, or I keep it quiet. Now he says, yes, I am the Messiah, but I'm not a warlike Messiah. I'm going to be the Messiah who dies. That's, that's, that's the point. Um, at that point, the teachers of the law are saying, why, why do we have to hear anything else? We know this man is a lawbreaker. He doesn't keep the Sabbath laws. He doesn't keep the purity laws. He heals people. He touches unclean people. He touches menstruating women. He touches corpses. He, he wanders among, uh, you know, uh, among the tombs and the Gentiles, for goodness sake. Th th this man is clearly cannot be God's Messiah. Therefore, we need to put him to death. What we are seeing is what Mark wants to point out is the collusion between the Jewish religious system and the Roman political military system. Mark is going to present Jesus' crucifixion as a Roman triumph. He is going to be whacked up on the cross with the, with the, uh, with the charge, the King of the Jews. We'll talk about that in one second. A bit more than one second. Uh, the King of the Jews. And, and it's a rebellion that has been put down. That's how, that's how the Romans crucify Jesus. They behave as though he was a rebel king, a rebel leader. And they, they beat him, they flog him, humili they humiliate him publicly, they torture him publicly, they lead him through the streets on the Via Dolorosa publicly, and they crucify him publicly on a hilltop. And, and the point about the, the, the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, binding Jesus and taking him to Pilate is that the Sanhedrin are the Roman foot soldiers. In, 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 in a Roman triumph, they would be the equivalent of the troops who have actually fought and defeated Jesus and his followers. And now they bind him and they take him to their ruler, Rome, and everyone else's ruler and say, here he is, do what you want with him. You know triumph hail caesar do, do you see what i'm saying and the question before pilate is are you the king of the jews now if jesus says yes which he does what's the significance of the charge the significance of the charge is that only rome could appoint the king of the jews that was herod and herod's herod's four sons afterwards so, so for Jesus to claim that he is the king of the Jews is to say, I am making a, a statement that we are not subservient to Rome. We are independent of Rome. And Pilate's going, we've got to get this guy killed. But he knows, he knows that he doesn't have to. We look at Pilate and Barabbas, you know, and, and, and Mark says, Pilate knew very well what, what was going on. It's not that Pilate was a very fair sort of guy who was trying to get Jesus off the hook. Pilate had one concern. He was a very brutal man. He's very brutal. He had one concern, and that was to keep the peace. Because um, it was Passover, and it was dangerous, and Jesus was very, very popular. And, and he didn't want trouble. So he pulls out Barabbas. Now, Barabbas... His name means son of, the son of the father, Bar Abbas. In fact, Matthew tells us his, his first name was Jesus. So you've got Jesus, the son of the father, Jesus, the son of the father. Jesus, the revolutionary who has killed people in order to bring about the kingdom of God, or Jesus who has stood against Rome in the name of the kingdom of God, but says it has to be brought about by peaceful means. Which way does the kingdom come? Which way do you guys all vote for? And they all go, we want this one. And they say, all right, so, so Jesus, what do I do with Jesus? Well, you crucify him. You crucify him. Theological point. 
what's sin? What is human sin? Have it, you've heard of original sin, right? The church talks about original sin. It has a doctrine of original sin, that we are all sinful and we are all fallen. What is original sin? Well, it's not what Augustine said, which is a kind of sexually transmitted disease since Adam, and we all get this guilt. What, what, what original sin means in real terms is that when you and I are given the choice, we choose to be God forsaken just about every time. We choose against God. We choose to crucify Jesus. When God comes to us in Jesus, we crucify Jesus. When, when the scientists and everybody tell us you're killing the planet, we choose to believe the pseudoscience that says, well, no, not really. And we've got plenty of time and don't worry about it, guys. We choose to be God forsaken. We need to be freed. Jesus says to us, if you do not forgive, then you will not be forgiven. If you hold the sin of anyone against them, it will be held against them by God. If you forgive the sin, it will be forgiven. Folk, if, if we believe in this stuff about forgiveness and God's forgiveness, we need to be a community that goes out and forgives. That's the only way in which the cycle of violence can be broken. Remember, after Auschwitz, anything we say about God must be able to be said in the presence of burning babies. And that means that we, our salvation story about God and about Jesus needs to be able to be said and heard as good news by those people. Not by us, it's by them. And it must not sound like some kind of appalling, cheap grace and heresy that goes, you know, it doesn't matter. Otherwise, only the people who are economically viable or politically powerful or religiously acceptable, only they can be saved. That's not the saviour of the world. That is not what God, Mark is telling us. This is the stories that we've heard. If this is working, as it were, if this is something that God is speaking to us about, it's about how, not only about how we, how we hear and, and, and pass on the messages, but how we can see, reconceive of ourselves as church and what it means to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, Jesus-shaped churches, full of Jesus-shaped people, making a Jesus-shaped difference. Those people do not do stuff like Holocaust. They do not do what is being done to the Palestinians. They have the courage and whatever is necessary to forgive and to stand up and to stand with and alongside and walk the walk, walk the way.